welcome to Peg and Coffee Talk. I'm Oswin, and I have with me Lord Knight. Today, let's talk about meditation. Considering the last podcast we did on meditation, uh, <laughs> that's like our number one podcast there. <laughs> right. We've had some interest in this topic, and I thought it would be good to cover some basics of what our meditation is and to kind of give people an idea of what to do and how to do it. Sounds easy enough, don't it? Sounds easy enough. <laughs> all right. So first of all, let's understand that this meditation is different than the normal meditations most people are used to. You know, most Correct. people are used to that transcendental type of meditation. You know, where you sit there, clear your mind, try to clear your thoughts and all this other stuff. Right. You're actually trying to attain that higher level of um, deity connection. Enlightenment or something right. to that effect. Right. And which, you know, we've argued for quite some time now that this is not necessarily the best way to do this or the only way. <laughs> right. Definitely not the only way. So let's see. So our meditation is an inward meditation where we actually try to think instead. Okay. So we're so, not we're not actually letting our thoughts, we're not trying to push our thoughts out. Right. We're not just going through them in a glimpse and a whatever, on fast forward, whatever. We're literally diving into these thoughts. Follow them out repeatedly until we've covered every base we can. Okay. Think about it like this. If you have a problem, no matter what it is, let's say you're trying to fix something, you would literally sit there and meditate and go through all the possible things that could be wrong before ever touching the machine. Okay. It gives you a chance to think about these things. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, to do this meditation, first of all, we've got to take care of some stuff. you got to take care of all physical needs. All right, there is one physical need you need to take care of before meditation for most adults. <laughs> if you happen to have that feeling, <laughs> do it. Wait about 30 to 45 minutes, then do your meditation. You know, if you get hung, if you're hungry, eat, make sure you eat some kind of light salad or something. So within 30 minutes, you can actually do this meditation. We basically tell everybody when we're training for this is that either you want to meditate at sunrise or sunset. But the more important thing there is to pick a time. Right. You need to pick a time and stick to it. Same time every day. Right. Same channel, same time. <laughs> Can we even get away with that? Or is that copyright? <laughs> um, I think it's copyrighted. Same time, same place, every time, <laughs> every day. If you happen to miss a day, just get right back on that horse and go and do it again. The very next day or as soon as you can remember, or get a chance to do it. Roughly, it's going to take about three months to first get used to actually meditating. Right. That's sitting because every time you sit down at first, it's going to be you're going to get an inch here. Your nose is going to itch. Your eyes going to itch. Your your your, your butt's suddenly going to itch. Mm -hmm. All right. Your best bet is when that happens, tell your body to sit down and shut up. Because our bodies are sort of um, they desire input. If they don't get it, they'll force you to have input. Absolutely. All right. So either they do want some type of touch or activity or motion. What you got to learn is how to push those feelings aside and tell your body to sit down and shut up, not your thoughts themselves. Right. If you've ever been a band geek, like I was <laughs> um, in marching band, we had a military style band. And so we were not <laughs> we were not allowed to scratch or anything, we were not allowed to wipe sweat from our face. <laughs> you had to learn to overcome that. And it takes time. It takes a lot of time. <laughs> now, I'm sure compared to when you first started to do that to when you finally graduated from high school, by the time you graduated, it was a piece of cake. Pretty much, yeah. Probably couldn't do it now to save your life. <laughs> <laughs> mm. 
Not on a daily basis, uh, <laughs> unless unless I'm meditating. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you ain't done it in a while, so. <laughs> right. The main point here is, yeah, you got to be in the right mindset to start this. Because your meditation actually starts beforehand. So once you got your spot, once you got your time, and you got your checklist done and all your physical needs taken care of, go to the bathroom, A, take care of any other needs you might have, you're going to sit down with some loose clothing, and you're actually going to try to actually start your meditation. So, And, yes, you do want to sit down. You don't want to do this laying down. No. You don't. That's gonna that's gonna create havoc when you try to go to sleep. <laughs> Trust me, that that comes from experience on my part. <laughs> <laughs> do not do this laying down. Sit in a chair if you got to. You do not have to sit on the floor in some lotus position with your you know ankle behind your head and breathe through your eyeballs type situation. <laughs> right. This is Just not. Become- what we- Sit down, get comfortable. Right, just maybe, be comfortable. Maybe put on some music that does not have vocals. All right, and if you can find somewhere where it's just music or sounds or nature sounds with some music over top of it, to me, this seems to work the best. I can't say nothing. I know Lord, Lord Nikita Foxfire used to meditate to Metallica. I think Lord Raceland did too. Yeah, I, I never could. So some people can, and if you can, go for it. Yeah, I could. Right. You might want to lay out some incense because, again, you do want some stimulus there for your body. Music, incense. So that way you can smell the incense and hear the music. This helps to keep, as we believe, the soul in the body so it can work on its own things instead of going out into the universe. It sort of helps you keep somewhat grounded in this reality to start off with. So I'm going to tell you what to imagine as you go through. This isn't necessarily a um, guided meditation like everybody's used to, but you're going to sit down. You can imagine roots coming out and anchoring you to the ground. This is still a style of grounding, but this is style is to keep your soul from exiting your body. With me so far? Yeah, you don't want to go floating off. Right. Somewhere into else. the atmosphere. Then you're going to center yourself by imagining some light around the solar plexus in the center of your body growing and surrounding you. When that light first comes, it's a white light. Then it's going to transform it through the colors, through the rainbows, ending in violet. So you're going okay, to go so through that's, So that's red, through. orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet. And violet. Right. Okay. Then once, that, once you get the violet, the light dissipates, and you'll find yourself on a path. You'll walk down the path a little way, and you'll normally notice a tree. That's a little bit different than the others, probably a little bit bigger or older, and it's going to wind up having some funky symbol on it that you've never seen but recognize. That's your symbol. You might not find it anywhere else but in this meditation. Okay. So it's uh, it's completely unique to you. Right. It's like your signature or your fingerprint or whatever. All right. When you touch it, that symbol normally turns into a doorway in which you then begin to proceed down 21 steps. As you step off that last step onto that 21st step, you'll actually step through a door. Now, this is where things get a little weird for us. (laughs) When When you step through this door, you're going to be in what we call a safe space as I roll my eyes (laughs) <laughs> but this is, but this safe space is a real safe space. All right. Imagine it as a, a bubble of order in the chaos of your subconscious. I think that's an appropriate uh, analogy. <laughs> right. When you're in this spot, you are actually, your, your consciousness is in your subconsciousness and it creates this space. Nothing can get in, nothing can get out without your permission. This is like your house, whatever. The strangest thing is it could be a forest. 
It could actually even be a uh, a cave. It could actually even be a house. I know some people do warehouses for some reason. It's just what their subconscious do. Right. It's uh, it's basically wherever you feel safe. It could be uh, a place from your childhood that you've recreated. It could be something completely new. Right. And it needs to be so safe that, you know, remember when you were a kid and you actually like put your head underneath the covers and you felt so safe in a spot that you relaxed enough to where in the world uh, you suddenly had to pee? Oh, yeah. That's the kind of safety we want to get to. That's the type of relaxing we want to get to, to where, you know, <laughs> muscles that normally are tense start to relax, too. Hence the reason you want to use the bathroom before you meditate. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing worse than getting all the way into your meditative state, starting to relax and going, oh, now i got to pee. <laughs> right. <laughs> or realizing too late that you have to pee. Now, what I normally tell people is somewhere in this safe space, you're going to make a, a room or a well or something. This is under your control. All right. <laughs> Completely under your control. Just like the dog. <laughs> So if you're using like a well or something, when you look in the well, you might see bubbles popping up. The bubbles are actually memories from your subconscious. You should be able to reach in, pick them up, and, and literally dive into those memories to relive them either as from your viewpoint, from when you were, when you experienced this, or even as a third party outside. It depends on, you know, where in the world your subconscious and your conscious decides it's the safest place for you to start observing some of these uh, memories. Okay. In other words, if it's more traumatic, you might actually see it like a person watching a TV show. Okay, that makes sense. All right. You'll see that it way as, you're not that way. You're not completely involved in that. Right. Because, again, all right, here's our problem is when we have these memories and stuff as kids, we have them as kids. We hold them in our memories as a kid. So if you experience something four years old and you start to relive it or look back at it, you're going to remember it and live it as if you were still four years old. Mm. So that's not going to it's not it's not going to manifest as an adult, as an adult. So, you know, somebody will manifest. Right. Somebody's mom died as a kid and they were like four or five years old and they really didn't understand what was going on at the time. Might find these very traumatic, but watching it this way as a third person, if you need to, starts to make you realize, OK, that's it wasn't what I thought it was. And then eventually, once you get used to it, you'll be able to experience as a kid at that age again. And then it starts to be able to mature. You'll start to be able to view it as more of an adult than as a kid. All right. That makes sense. That's one where we have to keep on sometimes revisiting these because, again, if it's something that happened at five, it's going to have to, okay, I need to experience this as a teenager. I need to experience this as, well, as a preteen, then a teenager, then in my 20s, and now at my current age. Right. So it takes a while for these memories to mature. It's kind of like that way it is a maturing. You're viewing it from different times in your life. Right. Now, again. And learning something different from it. From that age point of view, because as, right. our, as we grow up, our point of view about things start to change because we start understanding other things. Right. Well, a five-year-old kid might not understand that mommy passed away from cancer or something like this. Their only thought is my mommy left me. Right. But a teenager will see it a little differently. Right. And a 20 something will see it differently than a teenager. Right. That's just the yeah. different stage of your life. Well, and see, as long as we leave these memories unmature, we keep on behaving in that age range. Mm. Makes sense. So if, yes. we, if, so, if, so if something traumatic happened and then you and then something in your life reminds you of that, you're going to act like that age because that's exactly where everything's going to go back to. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. So like if suddenly a friend of yours dies, right, 
because of the death and everything, you suddenly start acting like a four year, your emotions start acting like a four year olds again or five year olds, even though you might be 30 something. It's because the first time you experienced this was with your mom when you were a kid. Right. So you're reliving it as a four year old. Right. Or five year old or whatever. Instead of as an adult. And then here, here's where we get psychological problems because again, something we experienced as a kid and something, then the, the similar circumstances might happen as an adult. The two informations on this might start to argue with each other. The five year old again is still sitting there thinking, okay, my mommy left me, but the adult in you is like, but she passed away. It wasn't her fault. Why do I, why am I still mad at her? Because you're still experiencing it as a four year old. Right. You have to get to the point where that four year old understands in your memory. What happened. Right. Right. In your memory. So that's where in the world this meditation comes out. And you can do it in a safe spot. If you want to stop, you stop. If you don't want to do if a, if a memory becomes too traumatic, you can just stop what in the world you're doing whenever you want. But then on the other hand, doing it this way, your subconscious and your conscious will start to kind of work together and it will only give, let you explore memories it knows you can handle now. Right. And if anything. So, so in other words, when you first start this, no, you're not going to suddenly hit the most traumatic thing first off. It's going to be a bunch of small little stuff first. Right. Until you start, until it's starting to say, until you finally got the confidence, okay, now we can start tackling the bigger stuff. Right. But now my suggestion is, is that at any time during your meditations, because this is what's going to happen, you need to have somebody that you can turn to. You need uh, to have somebody that you can uh, talk to, whether it's a friend, a counselor, a therapist. I mean, uh, if you, if a pastor, it doesn't matter. You need to have somebody you trust. Oh, most definitely. There's going to be a lot of psychological trauma there, and you're going to want to talk to somebody. Right. And even if you don't want to, you're going to need to. You know, I'd even go as far as to say, you know, if you get a, a therapist just to talk to, so you know they're not going to like go run their mouth, that's fine. That makes perfect sense to me. Absolutely. But, you know, when you come out of meditation, write down what you experienced then, what you felt, what you saw, what colors. And then you need to sit down and actually talk to that therapist about this stuff. Yes. To do this meditation, you have to have emotional and mental support around you. Yes. I mean, too many times we've had students come back to us just in a complete emotional mess because of something that popped up in their meditations. Oh, yeah, because, again, this is one of them things. I'm going to tell you that during this style of meditation, if you're doing this, issues you might have thought you've already dealt with might come back up. Issues you didn't know you had will come up. Oh, yeah. But eventually it will get to the point to where your shit cup is empty. You've gone through all your trauma. You've mm -hmm. cleaned out your house. And you're going to be sitting there one day, either, you know, looking at a bookshelf that you imagine all your your memories in or a well that could, where all your memories come up. And there's not going to be anything there. You're going to go through everything you need to go through. Right. When now once that starts to happen, you can start inviting things in. You can invite elementals in, sit down and talk to them. Angels sit down and talk to them. Your guardians or spirit guides to make it even better is once you're actually in that state and you're used to this and you've pretty much cleared out all the cobwebs out of your head and all your, you know, garbage that you have in your head and you've got a nice clean head to invite people in, deity, to sit down and actually have a conversation with them, to worship them, maybe even give them a little bit of praise, do a prayer, do it in the meditation. Right. If you have thought forms guarding your house, this is the best time to sit there and imagine sitting across from them and you giving them pieces of your life force energy. Or, right. Re reinforcing that thought form. Right. And doing it in a meditative state, see, this makes it even better because you're sort of halfway there anyway. You're more in the spiritual realm here. That means that these prayers and stuff will get there even better if done in meditation. Right. Now, 
coming out of the meditation, you do the same thing, but backwards, go up the stairs, go up the right, you know, go up your path to where in the world you started from, then go back through your colors from purple back to red, back to white. Let that light sink back into you, pull those roots out of the ground. Wake up and start to move around. Things you need to watch out for. If you find yourself bumping into things or being slightly distracted or not very observant, you're not grounding enough once you come out. No, you're talking not inside talking, of your meditation, but outside right. of your meditation. After you've left meditation, we still have to ground. You're going to have excess energy there, and this grounding is to get rid of that. Either eat something, eat something heavy, pasta, meat, bread. Meat does, for me and what I've seen over the years, meat does the best because it requires the most energy to process. Right. And we're talking red meat. We're not talking like a high protein like chicken or, or fish, fish or something. We're talking something really hard to digest. If you can't do that, go for a walk. Do not have sex. This will cause a, the, the chemicals in your brain to throw you farther into that spiritual realm and becomes even more dangerous because, again, not grounding properly on this. Yeah, I could see where somebody could actually walk out in the middle of the road and get hit by a car by not paying attention because part of their mind's still over in the spirit realm. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I mean, we actually had a, had a, a student at one point who – that's all they wanted to do was stay in that meditative state, and it became completely obvious every time we saw them. Yeah. And we had to tell them, you can't function in this world like that. No. No, I mean, again, we're, we're bringing back into that spirituality, which is nothing more than that, taking us father and father into the chaos. Right. You know, because a, a lot of people seem still seem not to understand this. Imagine our world, our ordered world, and how we can pretty much predict certain things. We know the sun's going to rise tomorrow, planets and stuff like that. Think about uh, one of the bubbles in uh, in soda, hmm. like Coca-Cola or something, in a glass. The Coca-Cola is chaos. The bubbles are ordered, and the bubbles are moving through the chaos. So we have to separate these two. When you're here, you have to be here. Your body still has to eat and do some certain other functions. And you can't do that if you got half too much of yourself over in the spiritual realm after meditating. All right. Makes sense. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, I mean, it does. Us. Other people might be looking at, looking at us going, what the hell are they talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Keep a diary. See what in the world happens. Do not exceed 45 minutes. Does it mean you got to start at 45 minutes? I would no, say, I'd, what, five minutes? Yeah, I would say when you're starting out, start with like five minutes, work your way up to 10 minutes. And, and of course, that's going to vary for people. So if you need to do five minutes for two weeks, go for it. If you need to do it for a month, go for it. There's no, you have to go at your pace. Right. You can't go at somebody else's pace. Roughly speaking, Within three months to six months, most of the people I know can that do this meditation will eventually learn how to, as soon as they sit down, they're already in that meditative safe space because they know how to feel and they no longer go through that whole entire after the grounding, going through the rainbows and going down the stairs. Right. And again, eventually, you know, within a year's time, yeah, well, within should. a year's time, you're going to start craving it. Oh, God, yes. I'm sorry. I keep on seeing where these guided meditations are a hindrance because people think they can't meditate without them. Once you learn that feeling, once you're able to get to that safe spot and you have that meditative feeling, as soon as you sit down, you don't need to do that anymore. You don't need to walk through there. So why no. do it? This is just a technique to train you to show you what it feels like when you are in a meditative state. Make sense? Right. And if you're if you're constantly doing a guided meditation, then you're not allowing yourself to well, explore. You're doing, 
You're doing what somebody else wants you to do. Right. You're not allowing yourself to explore what's in your head. I mean, it's just plain and simple. Right. It becomes a handicap. You just need to learn one guided meditation until you learn the feeling. Think about it this way. If you, okay, big comic book geek here, all right? <laughs> <laughs> it's the same thing that they talk about when they're, when they're like the X-Men and the mutants and stuff, when they're training people to use their power. Okay. Remember back when you first used your powers, what was going through your mind? How did you feel at the time? Recreate that to cause the trigger. Mm. Once they experience that enough times, once you experience that enough time, you learn how to trigger, to flip that trigger without having to go through a terrible memory. Absolutely. Same thing with meditation. Once you learn that trigger on how to get there, you no longer have to do a guided meditation. You can just sit down, go into a meditative state, and do what you need to do. 45 minutes, come out, go on with your life. This is the only daily meditation. This is the only daily thing you need to do. Doing your cards, burning incense, or anything like that ain't needed. There's no use to having your whole entire life wrapped up into the fact is that you're too busy lighting candles for 50 billion deities and you ain't got time to meditate. You got right. time to do a, you know, a card, a daily card reading or pick a card each day, but you don't have time to sit down and meditate. Right. If you meditate, I don't see where you need to do the card readings. And, you know, yeah. as far as, and now as far as actually interpreting what you see in your meditation, we've already talked about that. You just go back to what in the world we talked about on divination. It works for the same thing. Right. But the biggest thing is keeping a journal. Keeping a journal and going through this stuff. I think that's all I got to say on this. I think that pretty well wraps it up. And I think I'm out of coffee. I guess we'll see you all next week. Thanks for listening. Join us next week for another episode. Pagan Coffee Talk is brought to you by Life Temple and Seminary. Please visit us at lifetempleseminary.org to learn more. You can also find links to all our social media, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Reddit. We travel down this trodden path, the maze of stone and mire. Just hold my hand as we pass by a sea of blazing pyres And so it is the end of our days So walk with me till morning breaks And so it is the end of our days So walk with me till morning breaks